day, guys. It's like I never sleep, dude. I can never sleep. Muslims running their mouths. Anti-Trinitarians running their mouths. Acting tough. But when push comes to shove, they don't show up. So how you guys doing? Another late nighter. How you guys doing? <clears throat> it's 12.30 a.m. where I'm at. That means it's 3.30 a.m. in New York. So guys, another impromptu session, but the coward's not going to show up. His name is Awais Khan. If you guys can go to his Facebook page. He was running his mouth off, so I called him, and I said, come on, let's debate. And I said, we're going to debate Tawheed or, Tawheed or the <clears throat> morality of Muhammad. So he kept trying to bark and saying, oh, let's do Tawheed and Trinity. I said, come, you're going to defend Tawheed. See, what these guys want to do, they want to try to get you to do two topics in one so they don't defend Tawheed. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. So we'll see if this dog will call and defend Muhammad. His name is Awais Khan. So you guys can find him on Facebook. Say, come on. He's playing your song. But in the meantime, if you guys are not tired, some of you are. I know for some of you, your day is just beginning. So if the Father's pleased to use me, even though it's late here, I don't want to keep doing this, right? I don't want to keep just starting impromptu sessions unless we get some serious Muslims or anti-Trinitarians to engage me because it's becoming a waste of time. They're becoming a joke. So the next time what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure they got contact me on Skype before I go live. But let me see. Maybe the Holy Spirit wants me to be here to teach on something. So we yield to the Father. Father, we, we can ask that you bless us. We love you, Father. We don't love you the way we should and help us, Father, in that area to love you perfectly, to trust in you perfectly, to love the Lord Jesus perfectly, to trust in the Lord Jesus perfectly, to be cleansed and purified in the blood of Jesus and cleanse our loved ones, my daughters in the blood of Jesus and fill us. We love you, Holy Spirit. We trust in you, Holy Spirit. Help us to love you perfectly and trust in you perfectly. And <clears throat> sanctify us, sanctify our loved ones, sanctify my daughters for the glory and and on and praise of the Lord Jesus Christ. Save us from Satan. Save us from the world. Save us from our own sinful passions, Holy Spirit. And please perfect my ability for the praise of Jesus, not for the praise of men, to recall scriptures correctly and interpret them perfectly with wisdom from your presence, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, if you want to use me to glorify Jesus Christ in some sense, then your will be done. If you want me to silence the barkings of these rabid dogs against the Lord Jesus, then bring them. And if you want a lost soul to hear the message, to be convicted, to fall in love with Jesus, then bring them, Holy Spirit. Guide them and please anoint me. Recall the scriptures. Interpret them correctly. Destroy my forgetfulness. Destroy stammering and confusion. Loosen my tongue. Destroy distractions from the evil one. Please, Holy Spirit. And bless them here with wisdom and knowledge from your presence. Fill us, Holy Spirit, for the glory of Jesus. Lord Jesus, wash us. Father, set us apart for the glory of Jesus Christ. We trust in you. We love you, Father. Lord Jesus, we trust in you. We love you. Holy Spirit, we trust in you and love you. Please, if you want me to teach, then guide this conversation. In Jesus' name. All right. I can't be too loud. Again, what I'm going to do next time is I'm going to make sure I get them on Skype. I get them on Skype. And then I will go live. Awais Khan, another rabid, filthy dog, can blaspheme and bark, but... That's why we break their spiritual teeth and show they're all bark, no bite for the Lord Jesus. And may the Holy Spirit crucify my flesh and constrain me and give me perfect self-control, not to sin in my anger, but to glorify Jesus Christ. Now, most people are asleep now. Those of you awake, like I said, if you guys have a question, feel free to share it with me. And I'll try to answer it because I don't think he's going to show up. Hey, see, I know it's some of your days at the beginning. You respect me. God bless you, buddy. I'm going to be trying to get people by slowly, but surely I'm going to try to get people on a variety of topics. I already got someone scheduled next week, God willing, if the Lord wills, on the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Mother of our Lord Jesus. He's going to probably do it on Tuesday if everything goes well. <clears throat> Deuce, go to sleep, brother. Don't worry about it. It's going to be archived. Don't, don't torture yourself because they'll be archived you can listen to it later but for those of you who are just wakening 
your day's just beginning. I don't have a specific topic because, again, Mohammedans bark like they're filthy prophet, the son of Satan. But when push comes to shove, they don't show up. So what I want to do is, if God wants to use me, I want to bless you, the people of God, for the glory of Jesus. Right? If you have a question, I'll take it, and I'll just read the verses because we don't have the mods helping me today. God bless you. Thank you, LBW. Okay. Any questions, folks? Because I don't think the Muslims are going to show up. Let's see what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. We'll, we yield to the Holy Spirit. If he wants them to come, they'll come. Yeah. I'm going to be trying to be more intentional in making sure that if I do a live stream, they'll show up, the Muslims. So what I think I'm going to do is I'll call them first on Skype, and then we'll go live. Do you want to call me or do you want to ask me questions? If you guys want to call me on Skype, here you go. If the Muslim calls, I'm going to have to interrupt our discussion. If the Muslim calls, I'll have to interrupt our discussion. But I don't think he'll call. He's too embarrassed of his prophet. Here's my Skype. Benny underscore Malik 3. Benny underscore Malik 3. Wally, when you ask me, do miracles happen? God is still sovereign. God is almighty. God is real. And God is still able to do miracles and he does miracles so yes miracles happen they're happening we may not see a miracle but it doesn't mean they're not taking place right okay what does worship look like like you today like you can you clarify your question brother i don't know what you mean vine re-ask your question yep what was your question and guys ask me the question folks because Again, he's not going to show up because he backed down because the filthy coward wants to attack Trinity. Hey, Ramson is support. Good question. Now, let me give you about my background. I started out as a Baptist, not knowing much about the differences. Okay? Just Ramson. I didn't know much about the about Arminian evangelicals or Calvinist Reformed Christians. And didn't know much. All I knew was I went to a Baptist church. They made an altar call, call where you pray, the sinners pray, and ask the Lord Jesus Christ into your life and, you know, read the Bible. Later on, around the age of 20, when I came back to the Christian faith, then I started encountering the differences. And for a season, I became a staunch five-point Calvinist. But it doesn't mean I was the most knowledgeable or educated Calvinist, right? You know, I heard some preachers and I really, really believed the Bible taught Calvinism. But as I started exploring other Christian opinions, mainly because of James White. James White is, is a five-point Calvinist. He's a Reformed Baptist. He's not Presbyterian. He's Reformed Baptist. It's because... Of him debating Roman Catholics. Hey, Magdalene, how are you, sister? I don't think the Muslims are going to show up, so I'm going to just use this as a time to teach if you guys are interested. The Lord Jesus bless you, Magdalene, and Miss Vicky or Miss V. Did I call you Miss Vicky? What did I call you, Miss V? The Lord Jesus bless you. Alan, God bless you, brother. Aren't you tired? Okay. So, because of James White's debate with Roman Catholics, Ramson, I became exposed to another side because, remember, being raised among Baptists, the Roman Catholic Church was a corrupt satanic church. The Pope is the Antichrist. The wafer was basically a repackaging of pagan rituals masquerading as Christianity. The statues were basically the statues of the gods and goddesses repackaged as Christianity. This is what I was taught. This is what I was exposed to. And that the Jesuits, now here's what's ironic though. The Jesuits, the Society of Jesus, were infiltrating behind the scenes to bring about a one, one world government, one world government, right? A one world government headed by the Antichrist. Because the Jesuits were working with the Masons and the Illuminati. Okay, now, here's what's ironic. Here's what's ironic. I guess we got our customer. I think this is that filthy dog. Again. 
you got five seconds and identify so before I block you. Five seconds. Hello. Who is this? Hello. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Wait, wait, wait a minute. Do you want me to embarrass your, your mother and father for call, using the name Father of Shem Shemun? I want to punish your prophet for being this stupid. You know that, right? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Do you want me to really embarrass your prophet for using the name Father of Shem Shemun? Do you want me to really punish your prophet for that? Okay. So why didn't you use your name, Awais Khan? Why did you take this name, try to mock me? You think you're going to get far? You know what your Quran says, right? Chapter 6, verse 108. Can you open up your Quran and read that for me, 6, 108? I'm not Awais. I'm not, I'm not him. Are you sure? Yes. Okay, open up your Quran, chapter 6, verse 108. I want to see if you're a true Muslim. Uh, what? Open it up was? your Quran. Do you want me to block you? If you hear me. You're, uh, it's a uh, very clear six chapter six of the Quran verse one oh eight. One oh one oh eight. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Please read it for me slowly but surely so others can hear you. Wait, wait. You too. Wait, wait. You're another one that says wait, wait. Well, lady. Uh, Saki pray if they're going to be sincere then yes if they're going to mock then they won't last long Okay, do you have the crown with you or no? And do not insult uh, those They invoke other other than Allah lest they insult Allah in enmity without knowledge. Okay, so are you going to respect okay. your Quran? Are you going to respect your Quran and not say anything silly so that I can then attack your prophet and God and insult them you want to now no insults, and you're gonna be, you're gonna respect what your Quran says. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. So let me let me ask you one question, okay? Uh, let hold me on. Ask you a question. Before you ask me a question, you're here telling me what to do on my own channel. No, 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 no. You said, you said that. You said uh, we uh, we can ask you questions. No, I didn't you say that, that to Muslims. No, no, no. Yes, yes. No, I didn't said, say that to Muslims. You, you said, do you want you me to hang up on you, you insult your prophet? Listen to me. Don't talk over me. You want me to hang up and insult your prophet? I said to the Christians, if they have questions, ask me because I'm waiting for the Muslims to debate. So don't lie. Why not? Because why, why you not Muslims why like not? to run. Do you want why? me to answer you? Because your Muslims are embarrassed of your prophet. You like to run. You don't like to defend him. Are you embarrassed of your prophet? Just say, I'm embarrassed. I'll let you ask me a question. Say, yes, I'm ashamed of Muhammad. Wait, wait a second. Are you ashamed of your You're prophet? Are you ashamed of your prophet? Are you ashamed of your Bible? Uh, no, your, your prophet thought said my Bible is true. So if I'm ashamed of my Bible, okay. that means I'm ashamed of your prophet. Yes. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Go so to chapter four, verse twenty-four of the Quran. Chapter four, verse twenty-four. Chapter four, verse twenty-four. Chapter four, verse twenty-four. I'm gonna hang up on you, and I'm going to insult okay, Muhammad. Right, right, right. Chapter four, verse twenty-four. Open Surat and Nisa. Okay. Open Surat and Nisa. Don't waste my time. It's late here. Chapter four, verse twenty-four. It's actually a waste, but he's scared to admit it's him. Okay, chapter 4, verse 24. Wait. And, uh, and women accept those your right hand, uh, right hands possess the degree of Allah upon you and uh, lawful to you are beyond these that you see them uh, with your property, desiring chastity, uh, not not unlawful sexual intercourse. So for whatever you enjoy from them, give them their due compensation as an obligation. Okay. And there is no blame upon you for what you do mutually uh, agree. Okay, the first okay. part where it says unlawful for you, our married woman except your right hands possess. Give me the historical context. Why was this ayah sent down? I don't know. Don't don't lie to me. You should know. You're Muslim. You, do you know your Quran? Do you know why this ayah was sent down? Yes or no? No. You're kidding me, right? You're just saying no just to say it? 
No, I don't. Seriously. How? Wait. You're calling me, and you want to challenge me on the Bible, and you don't know your Quran? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Do I have to be expert? Yes, Do because be before expert? you you attack another religion, you need to know your religion before you can criticize another religion. How dare you want to criticize yeah. my Bible? And, 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 and same thing apply you uh, to you, right? Friend, I know I know your Bible. Quran better than your prophet, and I know my Bible. So don't Not don't Quran, make me no no. Bible. Bible. Don't talk over me. Don't change the subject. Unlike you, I've studied the Bible and the Quran. The Give me the reason why 424 was revealed. Give me the reason. Is this, is this topic related to Tawheed? Oh, you want to talk about Tawheed? You don't want to talk about Muhammad's morality? Yes, yes, Tawheed. So are you sure? Morality. So you don't want to talk about morality. you. So you want to talk about Tawheed? So you're going to keep yes. your questions about the oneness of God. That's what you want? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I just want to make sure everyone heard you. He does not want to talk about the morality of Muhammad. He doesn't want to talk about the yes. moral, ethical teaching of Muhammad. So you guys heard that, right? Okay. He wants to talk about the nature of God. So we're going to stick with the nature of God, right? Okay, okay. But wait, you're going to stick to the nature of God. You're not going to change subject. I want to get okay. an agreement. It's going to be the nature of God, right? Okay, fine. fine. Yeah, but you're not answering me. What fine? So you want to fine, talk fine. Okay. Go ahead. nature of God. Okay. So if we're going to speak okay. about the nature of God, uh, I'm going to be fair yes, and nice to you. What's your question about the nature of God according to my Bible? Go ahead. Uh, your, uh, your Bible says that God of Israel is greater than any other God. Okay? Mm -hmm. Do you know that? God of Israel is greater than any other God. What's your question? Do you know that or not? Okay, I'm going to ask you a third time. What's your question? Do you know that? You, do you know that your Bible says that God of Israel is greater than okay, any other God? Okay, what's your question? If I ask you one more time, I'm going to hang up on you. What's your question? Coward. Okay, let me ask you. Wait, wait. I'm a coward. Okay, wait, wait. No, 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 no. Now, because you're a filthy dog, I'm going to disrespect your prophet because we just read six one oh eight, right? You remember 6108? But you I know you know Muhammad is filthy and you piss on him because if you respected Muhammad, you wouldn't speak like a dog. Now I'm going to embarrass you. Go to chapter 19 of the Quran. See, now you speak like a dog. I have to muzzle you. Go to chapter 19 of the Quran. You got five seconds. Go to chapter 19 of the Quran. Five seconds. Go to chapter 19. You got five seconds. Suratul al Maryam. What about my question? Five, four, three, two, one. Go to chapter 19. I'm going to hang up on you and your prophet who's in hell. Go to chapter 19, verses 16 and 21. Open it. Go to chapter 19, 5, 4, 3. You filthy dog. We piss on Muhammad, that dog bastard. Sorry, guys. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait, wait. You see, they don't respect Muhammad, guys. Okay, They don't respect Muhammad. You know why? Because their Quran, their filthy book of porn, their satanic book tells them, do not disrespect the gods of others, lest they punish Allah. Remember he read that? And he still had no respect. He's got no class. Coming back to the issue of Ramson. Okay, Ramson, are you there? Yeah, I don't waste time with people like this. Because Ramson... No, it's okay, Ms. B, because these Muslims, they're bullies, Ms. B. These Muslims have been bullying people, antagonizing people, raping their women, right? Whoring women and murdering men to scare us. Now they can't, they can't handle it. They're like narcissists. Let me explain what it is. If you've dealt with narcissism, Muhammad was the perfect example of narcissism. He is narcissism in the flesh. I know because I've dealt with narcissism. Okay, for those of you who don't know what narcissism is, go study narcissism. Narcissists have to bully you, intimidate you, control you, and dominate you. When they can't, then they play victim, they play <clears throat> martyr, and then they vilify you for, for martyring them. That's Muhammad, and that's his followers. It's a demonic spirit. It's an evil demonic spirit. Because when you insult them, why you insult me, man? I, I think you're Christian. Oh, but when your prophet insults people, curses people, rapes their women, whores women, 
and murders them, that's okay. That's narcissism. Okay, now, <clears throat> coming back to the issue, coming back to the issue. Okay. Before you ask me about uh, Muhammad Hassan, before you ask me, I'll answer your question, Mom, because you sound to be like a nice guy. You have sincere questions. Ramson, are you here? Because I want to finish the answer for you, Ramson. Because you're asking me a question, right? Could you repeat your question, Ramson? Because I want to finish it for your benefit. Oh, gee, Isaac, you're cool. Man, dude. Okay, repeat your question, Ramson, so I can answer it. So I can answer because we're having a discussion. Because I'm going to talk about my journey. Okay. He had a good question because I want to tell you how I got here, right? How I got here. Yeah, I'm waiting for Ramson to repeat the question so I can remember the context. I'm going to finish it, guys. No, you're talking about Calvinism. That's what it was. So, see, Ramson, even you forgot your question. Okay. I became a staunch five point Calvinist in the late 90s, early 2000s because. I, I encountered people like James White, Robert Morey, others. But because of James White's debates, guys, here's my journey. Okay, Because of James White's debates with Roman Catholics, I used to think, remember, this is where I left off, that I thought Roman Catholic, Catholicism is evil from the pit of hell, false gospel, false Jesus, way for God. All right. And remember I was saying, if you remember, if you remember I was saying, I used to think, Jesuits were behind everything, and they're working with the Masons and the Illuminati and the Trilateral Commission and the Bilderbergers to form a one world government. Now, here's what I was saying. Ironically, you know what's ironic? Did you know? Again, don't misunderstand me. There is there is a movement out there trying to bring about a one one world government. There is a movement trying to bring about a one world government. And they're trying to bring out, bring about a one world ruler whom the Bible identifies the Antichrist. You even have Roman Catholics. You have Roman Catholics here. Alan Ruhl is here. That, uh, that believe that Masonry has infiltrated the Vatican and that you have many priests and cardinals bishops. They're not really Christian. They are Satanists, even perhaps closet Masons who've infiltrated the Roman Catholic Church because they're working behind the scene to bring about the destruction and collapse of the Roman Catholic Church. Taylor Marshall, infiltration, right? Exactly. So the problem is, is that in the 90s, I got so much into that, I became paranoid. Amen. I hope you love Jesus more than me. If you, if you even love me that much, lady, then you have issues, okay? Okay, I got paranoid. My paranoia was not healthy. Because why? Because I became fearful of everyone until God set me free. And so right now, I really don't care about the Jesuits or the Masons or the Bilderbergers or Trilateral Commission. You know why? Because if it's prophesied and this has to happen, what are you going to do to stop it? If you believe Revelation is referring to the future, where Antichrist will come to prominence and power, how are you going to stop that? That is something that has to come to pass for Jesus to then descend physically from heaven and establish his earthly kingdom on earth, where he'll be physically, bodily ruling in Jerusalem. So why are you paranoid? Why are you freaking out, losing your mind? In one way, let the chips fall and rejoice because once you see that one world leader, you shouldn't panic. You know what you should do? Rejoice. You know why? Because if the one world leader comes to power, that's the Antichrist. That means Jesus is at the door. He's coming down. So you should be praising praising, and saying, Hallelujah, Lord Jesus, your descent is at hand. You want me there? Lady, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't know if you're joking, pulling my leg, or you're here to being a distraction because you're distracting me because I don't understand. I love Sam, but I love my Lord more. I, okay. Who told you to make that comment? I have no idea. Okay. Okay, now, so 
after many years of wrestling and struggling, wrestling and struggling with Calvinism and these different perspectives, I can't, I, I have to say I'm no longer a Calvinist. So when you ask me about Calvinism, I'm no longer a Calvinism, a Calvinist, and I'm not an authority and expert on Calvinism. So whatever I answer would be from my limited background as a Calvinist. And there are Calvinists would say that I didn't know Calvinism with any great depth to comment on it. Right? You get what I'm saying, Ramson? But if you're asking me about Eve and her sin, are you asking me Eve and her sin? So what exactly are you asking me about her sin? What were you going to ask? I don't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture or mid-tribulation rapture. We're going to go through it till the end. Yeah, okay, Ramson, there's a tension in Scripture. Soteria. Soteria, I like that name. There's a tension in Scripture. What's the tension in Scripture? There are passages that talk about God predetermining what takes place in creation. But then there are passages in which God desires from the depth of his being the salvation of every creature and that human creatures are responsible to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ, turn and be saved. Those tensions are in Scripture. If those tensions were not in Scripture, you wouldn't have Calvinism, you wouldn't have Arminianism, meaning Calvinism can only exist if there are passages that spoke of God predestining everything, and Arminianism would only exist if there are passages that talk about humans having moral responsibility and the ability to make choices that affect their salvation and the future, and God designing the salvation of every creature. The question is, how do you reconcile those passages? How do you reconcile these tensions in Scripture? Well, Christians have been trying to do that for centuries, right? That's why you have Arminianism, you have Calvinism, you have Molinism, you have open theism, and a variety of attempts of trying to make sense of how all of this can be true. How all of this can be true. You with me there? Everyone there? Funny, I don't know if you're here to learn and be serious or you're here to mock and attack because, okay. See, truth defenders, here he is. He's a five, he, in fact, actually, he's a 10 point Calvinist. He's a 10 point Calvinist. He, he actually created five additional points of Calvinist because he wants to be a hyper Calvinist because he's always hyper. He's always angry. He's always mad. He's always attacking. So he's a hyper Calvinist, literally, an angry Calvinist. You get my point? Those tensions are in scripture, they're there. So what system best explains the tensions in Scripture? My position has been this. I'm okay with tensions. I'm okay with paradoxes. In other words, I don't have to be able to figure out all that the Bible teaches on a given subject. If there are passages that teach that God desires the salvation of every creature, and he's broken when a creature doesn't turn to him, amen. And if there are passages that teach that a person must be enabled by the Spirit to turn to God, <clears throat> then amen. How do I reconcile that? If I can, I will. If I can't, I leave it be. You get what I'm saying? I'm okay with tensions in Scripture. I'm okay with paradoxes in Scripture. I'm okay with passages that I can't fully reconcile and that I don't fully understand because the Bible tells us, folks, okay, the Bible tells us that God is beyond comprehension. We won't be able to fully comprehend him. He's unlike anything creation. And so when we study the scriptures, what they say about God, we understand he is beyond comprehension. He's a triune God. Jesus is the God man. How does that work? So there are things about God that the Bible says are beyond our ability to fully comprehend. We can see this is what the Bible says, but we don't understand how it works. And folks, that shouldn't shock you. There are things in creation, in the created order, that even scientists are baffled over. Scientists will tell you there are things in the created order, and this finite temporal creation, that they don't fully understand, and they do not 
comprehend how it works, but they know it works because they see it, even though they don't fully understand how it works and why it works the way it does. Now, here's my question to every one of you. Thank you, Robson. God bless you. Here's my question for every one of you. If temporal finite creation is so complex that we humans can't figure out every detail about it, we can see that things work a certain way. We don't know why they work that way, what makes them function that way, right, in every case, even if we just take it with the human body. Why would it surprise you? Why would it shock you that the creator of temporal reality is infinitely more complex and beyond our ability to comprehend? You want me there? So I'm okay with tensions in Scripture. Some people are not. Some people are not okay with tensions in Scripture. Some people have to figure everything out. Some people have to make sense of everything in Scripture. I don't. I'm okay with it. I'm all right with it. I am. You know why? The moment you ex accept a triune God and a two-natured eternal divine person, Jesus is eternally God, an eternal divine person who took on a human nature and a physical body, then that means you are accepting paradoxes and tensions that you can't fully comprehend, and you're okay with it. So then why just why just limit it to the Godhead or the two natures of Christ? Why not be okay with all the tensions and paradoxes in Scripture and say, wow, yeah, God's sovereignty, predestination, human responsibility, human choice, and human choices truly affect how the future will unfold. And how does it? I don't know. Okay with it. Can I give you an example of what I mean by attention in Scripture? Ramson, I just said there are things in creation that are contradiction to your mind. Do you reject it? I'll give you one basic thing. Like here, David Wood, he is a walking contradiction. Do you deny that he exists? David Wood is a walking contradiction. Do you deny he exists? Right? Okay, now Ramson, let's let's put him aside. Just something so basic that I was told early on. God bless you, truth seeker. Okay, Ramson, scientists are baffled about light because a light is a wave and a particle, but they don't know how it can be both a wave and a particle. That seems like a contradiction. Do you deny the existence of light? So Ramson, notice what you, again, you ignored what I said. So that means you want to now be in the judgment seat determining whether you're going to accept something is true if you're able to reconcile it, because if it's a contradiction to your mind, then it must be a contradiction. It may be a contradiction to your mind, but why do you assume that it's a contradiction to God's mind? Because as you go higher and higher, as you ascend to a higher level of understanding and intellect, what seemed contradictory on a lower level is now no, now no longer a contradiction as you go higher and higher, right? To a young child, calculus is a contradiction and doesn't make sense, right? To a young child, algebra is a contradiction, doesn't make sense. But then as you get older, calculus is not as baffling, not as confusing as it was when you were five, as it was when you were four, as it was when you were six, right? Why? Because as you get smarter and smarter and your intellect matures, what seemed to be a confusion and contradicting when you're on this level is now no longer a contradiction now that you've attained a higher level of understanding. So it may seem contradiction to you, but why would you then assume it's a contradiction to an infinite mind? Yeah. Now, truth defenders, again, because he has to argue because his nature is to debate and argue. This guy has to argue because he was neglected and a child and he was abused. So now he has to take it out on the world because he can't just shut up and agree. He has to always argue. Okay. Luke 22, 21, 22. See? This is why this guy gets blocked from my Facebook channel. I blocked this guy more than any human being in the planet. Right here. Guys, here, let me show you what I mean by attention in Scripture. 
that we can't fully reconcile. Jesus speaking of his betrayer, but the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The son of man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays me. Now notice Jesus says, the son of man must go as, as it has been decreed, determined, fixed, predestined. It's been predetermined, pre pre fixed that I will be betrayed. But woe to him who betrays me. Okay, now here's the tension. Judas is responsible and condemned for betraying Jesus, an act that was predetermined and fixed and could not be otherwise. Now resolve that tension. You want me there? Lady, I think you're going to have to get blocked because I have no idea what you're smoking, what you're on, what you're talking about. First Amendment, defender of it. What are you talking about? Are you okay today? Because you're being silly today. I don't know why, honestly. I don't understand your logic today. The comments make it make no sense. Did you take your med medication? Because I know it's late. Okay, now, did God force Judas to betray Jesus? Did God force Judas to betray Jesus and sin? Did God force Judas to betray Jesus? No, he didn't. Okay, ladies got to go. Lady, bye-bye. I hope you enjoy the fact that you're going to be blocked from this channel yeah, and get lost. No, 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 no. Block her. Don't want her back. Get her out of here. But wait, God determined that Jesus would be betrayed. So could Judas have chosen not to betray Jesus and falsify what God had determined? That's not answering the question, LBW. Let me make it a little more complex for you. Could Judas have gone against God's decree that Jesus would be betrayed and falsify God's prophecy? No, he couldn't. So does that mean God forced Judas to betray Jesus? No, he didn't. But could Judas have chosen not to betray Jesus? No, because he had to betray him to fulfill scripture. So is he compelled to betray him? No. You see how it works? Because you guys are asking me, right? You're asking me to bring up these tensions and paradoxes. No contradiction to God. Makes perfect sense. God didn't make Judas betray him, but Jesus had to be betrayed to fulfill prophecy. How does it work? Good luck figuring out. That's why you got Molinism, open theism, Calvinism, Arminism, because we're all trying to figure it out. Weeping sorrows. It's okay to be confused. That's my point. Weeping sorrows. That's okay to be confused because you're dealing with an infinite mind whose ways are beyond comprehension. Do you guys want me to go through all the scriptures? Now, I don't have someone to post for me, so I'm going to read them for you. Do you want me to go through all the scriptures where repetitively and repeatedly over and over and over again, God says, I'm beyond comprehension. I'm unlike anything in creation. You won't be able to figure me out, so don't even try do you want me to do that? So that if there's something that perplexes you, confuses you, you know what that means? Glory to God. God said, expect that. Weeping sorrows. God is telling you up front. God is telling you up front. Okay? Up front in the Bible, he, he the re reader, pay attention. I'm beyond your ability to comprehend. You won't understand my nature. You won't understand my ways. Because I don't do things the way you do. I don't think like you. I don't act like you. And the more you try to probe in my nature and the way I do things, the more you're going to get confused, the more you're going to be baffled, the more you're going to be perplexed. You with me there? Do you want me to give you those verses? Do you want me to give you those verses? Okay, I'm going to now have to, because then I have someone posting them, I'm going to have to get them ready. Hold on, let me get them. Let me, let me go. There's a lot of them, so I'm going to now get them ready. Hold on. There's too many, so I'm going to give you as many as I can. One second, guys. Let me go through here. There's too many, okay? So don't hate. Participate. Hold on, guys. Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot this one. This one is beautiful. 
I almost forgot it. So I got guys, bear with me because when I don't have mods and I have to then get them out for you. So don't be upset with me. Don't hate, participate. Don't hate the player, hate the game. <laughs> Stop it, All right? That was silly, right? Okay, 25, let me just do that. Yep, let's do this. Romans 11. Okay, three guys, be patient with me. Don't be haters, man. Man, you guys are a bunch of haters. Yep, see, I, see, I forgot another one. See, I almost forgot this good one. This was a juicy one. Yeah, man. Man, what it be like, man? What, wait, wait, wait. Another guy, he tell me, wait, man. You almost forgot this one from Job as well, you see? Because I'm trying to get as many as I can. Okay, let's go there. Man, why you why you like this, man? Why be like this, man? Why is life so hard, man? Okay, there you go. Let's begin. Are you ready? Everyone ready? There's a lot of them. Are you ready? Who's ready now? I'm going to read them for you. Okay. Who's ready? Okay, one second. Okay, let's go. Job 5 verse 9. Guys, pay attention. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. So his wonders are beyond comprehension. Job 9 verse 10 repeats the same point. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. Job 11 verses 7 to 10. Job 11 verses 7 to 10. Specifically 7 to 9, but I'm going to include 10 as well. Can you fathom the mysteries of God? Notice these are rhetorical questions, folks. Rhetorical questions expect a negative answer. No, you can't. So pay attention, guys, please. If you want to learn, pay attention, okay? Can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? Of course you can. They are higher than the heavens above. What can you do? They are deeper than the depths below. Show. What can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and wider than the sea. If he comes along and confines you in prison and convenes a court, who can oppose him? That was Job 11, 7 to 10. Job 36, 26. Job 36, 26. How great is God beyond our understanding? Did you catch it? How great is God beyond our understanding? Job 36, 26. The number of his years is past finding out. Can you... Count how, how many years, how old God is? Of course not, because he's eternal. And now Job 37, verse 5. Job 37, verse 5. God's voice thunders in marvelous ways. He does great things beyond our understanding. Okay, here you go. Job 37, verse four, 5. Did you catch it? Job 37, verse 5. Beyond understanding. You with me there? Everyone got it? Okay, now. Psalm 139, verses 1 to 6. Psalm 139, verses 1 to 6. You have searched me, O Yahovah, Lord, yod heh vav -He, and you know me. You know when I sit. Look, God knows when you sit, when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar, because God is separate from creation, transcendent from creation, yet he still knows what I'm thinking. You discern my going out. You know when I'm about to go out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Yahovah, know it completely. Even before a word comes out of my mouth, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before. You, you encircle me, right? And you lay your hand upon me. My life is in your hand and your control and your power. I can't escape you. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Too lofty for me to attain. Here you go. Psalm 139, verses 1 to 6. Is everyone getting it? Okay. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. So, weeping sorrows and everyone else. I'm not done yet. Now, now Zays, are you a Muslim? I'll be more than happy to debate as long as you can... Maintain proper decorum so I don't want to insult your prophet. Now, you guys see it? Weeping sorrows and everyone else. It says beyond understanding, beyond understanding. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. So why are you guys trying to figure it out? 
Why you guys think you're going to figure it out? What makes you think you're going to figure I'm getting there, John Doe. Romans 11, 33, 36. I'm getting there. Okay? But I got more. There's more. That was Psalm 139, verses 1 to 6. <clears throat> Psalm 145, verse 3. Psalm 145, verse 3. Psalm 145, verse 3. Here you go. Great is Yahovah and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. His greatness no one can fathom. So why are you shocked? There are things in the Bible you can't understand, can't make sense out of, that seems contradictory to you when you're a limited, finite, temporal, imperfect creature. So it is the height of arrogance, and I'm not saying Ramson's being arrogant. It's the height of arrogance to assume, well, if I can't figure it out, it must be contradictory. It's like a five-year-old saying, well, I can't understand algebra, so algebra can't be true. It's full of contradictions. You'd laugh at that, wouldn't you? That's what God does. He laughs. Oh, just because it's a contradiction to your mind, it can't be true? Who made you God? Who made you judge, jury, and executioner? See the point? And by the way, side note, before I move on to the rest of them, this is the heart of Satanism. You know what Satanism is? Can I tell you what Satanism is? And I hope I'm still benefiting you because these Mohammedan cowards won't defend their prophet. And I'm going to retitle this. You know what Satanism is? What is Satanism according to Scripture? What is Satanism according to Scripture? Satanism is the worship of self. Being your own God. It's not just pride. See, truth defenders again. He's okay. You're trying, bro. I give you A for effort. Because what was the satanic lie? You can be gods knowing good and evil. In other words, the heart of Satanism is the worship of self. Making yourself God over your life. Making yourself the judge of what's right or wrong. Determining what's right or wrong. And governing your life. Doing what you will. That's Satanism. That's Satanism. Go to Genesis 3. You shall be like God, knowing good and evil. Meaning, you will no longer submit to God and trust God to tell you what's right or wrong and how to live. Right? But you're telling God, no, I think I can do things better. And I'm much smarter than you. And I know what's best for me and how to do things, what to do and not to do. So I think I'm more qualified than you to govern my life. You get it now? So it is the heart of Satanism to say that, you know what? It doesn't make sense to me. It can't be true because that means now you're sitting in the judgment seat, becoming God, determining what can and cannot, cannot be true, what can and cannot be right. Yes, Islam is Satanism. Muslims are Satanists when they tell you God can't be a trinity. Why? Why can't he be a trinity? Because it doesn't make sense to me. Well, last time I checked, <clears throat> you're not God. You're in no position to tell God what he can and cannot be, what he can and cannot do, and what's right or wrong for God. You get my point? You understand, right? You understand? When you say what's when something can and cannot be true or what something can cannot be right, even though it's in the scripture, even though the Bible teaches it, even though Jesus says it, then you're pretty much becoming God and the judge over God in his word. That's Satanism. Now, Zays, the Quran doesn't preach that Allah is one person. Do you want me to embarrass you? You can call me and I'll embarrass you, but let me finish the verses. Can I continue? Guys, focus. Don't let this demon distract you. I'll deal with him later. Here's other verses. Psalm 147, verses 4 and 5. Guys, this one should blow you away. <clears throat> Psalm 147, verses 4 to 5. Psalm 147, verses 4 to 5. He determines the number of stars and calls them each by name. He determines the number of stars. He determines how many stars there are, and he calls each of them by name. He knows the name of every star that he created. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. Did you catch it? Yes, Ramson, exactly. Attention. He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Can I ask you a question? 
What kind of mind must God possess to know the billions of stars and these billions of galaxies, know their name because he created each one of them and he's named each one of them? See it right here. Let me post it again. Psalm 147, 4 and 5, this is verse 4. Why do you think the next verse says this? Verse 5 says this. The very next verse, after saying this, goes on to say in verse 5, okay? Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. <clears throat> you see it? Okay. A couple more, then we'll take other questions. Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, verses 17 to 18. Isaiah 40, verses 17 to 18. So this is Isaiah chapter 40, verse 17 and 18. Before him, all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded as less than nothing, worthless. That's how God views the nations. They're less than nothing, right? Right. Regarding them worthless as less than nothing. With whom then will, will you compare God? To what image will you liken him? To whom will you compare God? What's the answer? To nobody. Now, Isaiah 40 <clears throat> Verses 25 to 26. Isaiah 40, verses 25 to 26. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal? Says the Holy One. Answer, no one. <clears throat> no one's like you. No one is comparable to you. No one's your equal. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? She's telling us. You, maggots, look to this skies. Look to the heavens. Look around you. Who created the expanse? Who created space? Who created the sun and the moon and the planets and these billions of stars? Look, ask, ponder. He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Did you guys catch it? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. God is telling you, look to the galaxies. Look to space. You see those billions of galaxies that modern science has discovered and billions of stars? He's saying, I created each star individually. I brought each star into being one by one, one at a time, and each one I gave a name to. Nora, don't start the nonsense before I block you. Flat Earth, Round Earth, you're gonna you're gonna have a flat head. You keep it up. Thank you, guys. Guys, God bless you for the super chat. Cabbage, I've already answered it before, but I'll answer it again. Just be patient. Okay, Ramson, everyone else, did it sink in? Did it sink in? What is the Bible repeatedly saying? What is it repeatedly affirming over and over and over again? Nothing comparable to God, nothing equal to God, nothing likened to God. God's ways, God's thoughts are beyond comprehension. His understanding is beyond comprehension. His knowledge is beyond comprehension. You can't figure him out. Okay, we got more though. Isaiah 58 verses 8 to 9. Isaiah 58 verses 8 to 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. Okay, so why do you think that I think like you? I act like you, and I do things like you. Hey, look here. I don't act like you. I don't think like you, and I don't do things the way you do them. Plain and simple. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways. I don't do things the way you do them, and I don't think like you. So don't try to bring me to your level, and don't try to ascend to my level. Everyone there? declares Jehovah as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts okay you see how expanse space is the earth is engulfed in space right you see how deep space is that's how deep my thoughts are in comparison to yours Brian Zhu, stop the nonsense, you Mohammedan dog, because I'll embarrass you, okay? Typical Ahmad Didat argument. Stick around. I'll have you call, and I'm going to use that argument against Didat and his God, okay? 
Did everyone see that? Is that sinking into everyone? A few more from the New Testament will be done. Okay. Let me go to Ephesians 3, 17 to 19, specifically 18 to 19. Guys, do make sure you're listening and focusing the repeated assertion of Scripture, of the incomprehensibility of God, the incomparability of God, incomparability of God, incomparable incomparability of God. Okay, watch. Watch here. So that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in the love of God, Christ, the triumph God, established in his love, planted in his love, having no doubt of his love for you and being filled with his love for him and one another, that you may have the power that God will enable you together with all the Lord's holy people, all the saints, to grasp how wide, how long, well, let's say wide, long, I don't even mind, high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, <whistles> that you may be filled to the, full, to the measure of all the fullness of God. Wait, guys, can I ask you a question? Mods, can you get Brian Z out of here? Please. Can you get him out of here? Okay, can I ask you a question? Because I don't want Satan to distract you guys. It says, to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Now, can I ask you guys a question? If the attribute of love, of divine love, one attribute of Christ, this is thinking of Christ, one attribute of Christ, his actual love is beyond understanding how much more do you imagine Christ in respect to the fullness of his divine nature is incomprehensible? If one of his attributes, just his attribute of love, is beyond comprehension, how much more beyond comprehension is Christ in all his fullness and totality? Look at it. It says, just this is about Jesus, by the way. And side note. This shows that Jesus isn't a creature because Paul is saying the love of Jesus is beyond comprehension. You don't say that of a creature. Paul could only say this about Jesus if he believes that Jesus is the incomprehensible infinite God. Sweetie, what sin did you commit for me muzzling you like a dog and then bouncing you out of my chat channel? Get him out of here. Get sweetie out of here. Okay. Okay, now... Philippians 4, verse 7. And then we'll read Romans 11. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Okay, now this is Philippians 4, 7. Guys, help me understand this. If the attribute of God's peace, just one attribute, peace, transcends all understanding, how much beyond comprehension do you expect God to be in all the fullness of his essence. You'll see it because you're going to be blocked and you'll be sent there to look at it. Do you guys see it? Philippians 4, 7. Is everyone getting it? For all of you? You see how many passages over and over and over again? incomparable, utterly unique, transcendent, unlike anything creation, beyond comprehension, beyond understanding. Finally, the final one, Romans 11, 33 to 36. Romans 11, verses 33 to 36. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments. Okay, so why are you trying to search them out? Okay, guys, Rams and everyone else. How unsearchable his judgments. So why are you trying to search them out? If Paul just told you they're beyond searching, beyond searching, why are you trying to figure it out? Why are you trying to make sense out of it? And his paths beyond tracing out. Oh, wait. So God's path, the way he does things, beyond tracing out. So, folks, why are you then trying to search out God's judgments? And why are you trying to trace out the past, the way he does things, when you're just told his judgments are unsearchable, beyond your ability to search out, and his past beyond tracing out?
You with me there? Clear? So let me finish it, 34 to 36, so we can go to other questions. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Nobody has. God's mind is infinite, beyond comprehension. Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? Does God owe you anything? Absolutely not. Everything you have, the life, the breath, the health, the provisions, the ability to work and make money, the intellect is from God. You owe God everything you have is from him. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever and amen. So what's the point of this? To sum this all up and I'll open up to other questions. What's the point of all this? The point is simply this. Stop trying to figure out God and his fullness. God is beyond comprehension, beyond understanding. His nature is infinite. It's incomprehensible. He's unlike anything in creation. Nothing comparable to him. He transcends creation. His ways are beyond your ability to comprehend, right? So don't try to figure them out. And don't be surprised. Don't be shocked that you're going to find things in the Bible that you can't understand, make sense out of. Because God told you, expect that, right? God told you, expect this of me. No, that's not what I said, uh, For You didn't hear me. You didn't hear me. So because you misrepresented me, I'm tempted to block you because I don't like people who come to my channel, think they heard and understood my point, and then end up contradicting me or misrepresenting me and, and twisting my words. Muhammad Hassan, you know you embarrassed yourself, right? Muhammad Hassan, chapter 42, verse 11 of the Quran. In chapter 112, verse 4 of the Quran, it says, Allah is like unlike anything creation. So Allah is a liar, Muhammad Hassan? Is Allah a liar? The Quran says that. Chapter 42, verse 11. Chapter 112, verse 4 of the Quran, it says, Allah is unlike anything. Nothing comparable to Allah. So why would you just say God is a God of confusion or the author of confusion when that means you just buried Allah in hell? So now, according to you, your God, Allah, is the author of confusion because he's unlike anything. You can't compare him to anything. So, Muhammad Hassan, why do you talk out of ignorance? Because, you know, every time you say something, you destroy the Quran. No, that's not the meaning of the verse. Don't change it, Muhammad Hassan. 1 Corinthians 14.33 doesn't mean what you think it means. I'll come to it. But can I ask you ser ser seriously, Muhammad Hassan? Why do you make statements that only end up destroying your deen and your Quran and your prophet? Vine, I don't know what kind of mystical traditions they developed, but I, I'd have to know before I comment. I don't want to speak in ignorance. Muhammad Hassan. If God is beyond comprehension, does that mean Allah is the author of confusion? Is that what you're saying? So you understand Allah? You figure out Allah? You know Allah inside and out? Okay, so then why would you make that comment? Okay, now you know what he's referring to, Muhammad Hassan? He's referring to 1 Corinthians 14.33. Okay? 14.33, where it says God is not the author of confusion. Can I explain what that passage means and what it doesn't mean? Are you guys ready for that? Are you ready for that? Well, Vine, how could I say anything negative about mystical traditions that are anchored in the deep, intense, spiritual worship of the triune God? Right? To be lost in his, in his presence and be filled with the presence and love of the triune God in intense worship and sacrifice. How can I say anything negative about that, man? Okay. 1 Corinthians 14.33 says, God is not the author of confusion. Okay, guys. Let me give you the context and you tell me if you figure it out. Okay? We're going to read 1 Corinthians 14. We're going to read 26. Well, let's read to 36. Okay? Wait with me because I don't have someone to post verses for me, so I'm going to do it. When I read it, tell me what you think it means and what it doesn't mean. 
First Corinthians 14, 33, but it has a context. We're going to read 26 to 36, okay? You guys ready? Nor I've done, I have an article on this, and I may do that. Are you ready now for me to talk, to read it? Now, you guys, ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate you and focus. Focus. Okay. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters? When you come together, each of you has a hymn. That means each of you has a song of praise or a word of instruction to exhort people. A revelation. Maybe the Holy Spirit's revealing something. A tongue. You may want to worship in a specific language or an interpretation. Someone interprets it. Now watch. Tell me what the context is. Everything must be done so that church may be built up. That's your goal, to build up, not destroy, tear down. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at the most three should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. So it has to be an interpreter. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. Keep it to yourself because if you're speaking in a language they don't understand, then you're not benefiting them. You're not building them up. It's not about you. It's about building everyone. Now watch here. Two or three prophets should speak, and the other should weigh carefully what is said. Meditate and, and focus intently on what these prophesying, prophesying imply. And if a revelation comes to someone who's sitting down, the first speaker should stop. So if I'm speaking but the Holy Spirit reveals something to this prophet, I need to sit down, and right away he has to speak. Okay? For, few, for you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. You have control over your spirit, over your mind, over your emotions by the Holy Spirit empowering you. As long as you're filled with the Holy Spirit, he will empower you to control your urges and not be controlled by them. Okay. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord's people. Now, before I move on, what does he mean by confusion here? Is he talking about God's nature is not going to be confusing and perplexing to baffle you? Or is he talking about creating confusion and chaos in the church by speaking out of turn, by prophesying out of turn and causing chaos and confusion. Is that what he, what is he talking about? This is why here in this translation, not my favorite, but at times it does an excellent job. Here it is. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord's people. The word confusion means disorder, disorderly conduct, conduct chaos, confusion where two prophets speak at the same time, or three people speak in a tongue at the same time, they're all speaking out of turn, creating chaos and confusion, and no one's benefiting. Let me continue. Women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it's disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Or did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only people it has reached? Okay, do you understand what the context is now? Is Paul saying in 1 Corinthians 14, 33? Is Paul saying in 1 Corinthians 14, 33 that God's nature won't be confusing, perplexing, and baffling? Is that what he's saying? Or is he saying that God has not <clears throat> called you to chaos and confusion and disorder. God has not built up the church to be a church that is disorderly, chaotic, and confused. Nora, Ed, it's a different point. He's talking about women who are disrupting the service, speaking out of turn, causing chaos, and it's married woman, Nora. It's not done about all women because he says the woman should ask her husband, don't create chaos and speak out of turn and promote confusion. Sit, listen quietly. Don't, don't stir things up and confuse things and start a division and ask your husbands at home. So it's a specific context about a specific group of women in a specific situation who are married. He's dealing with disorderly conduct and worship in, in Corinth. Now, Muhammad Hassan. Okay, Muhammad Hassan, you know I'm going to embarrass you, right? 
Remember I said, Muhammad Hassan, every objection you bring up against Christianity, I'm going to turn it against your prophet. Why is Islam so confused? Sunni, Shia, Ahmadiyya, Nation of Islam, and then in Shia, you have the Rafida, you have Alawi, you have Druze, right? You have Ismaili, and in the Sunni, you have Ashari, Athari, and then you have Maturidi, and then you have the Salafi. You see how stupid you sound? In fact, Muhammad Hassan, didn't even your own prophet say there'll be 73 sects of Islam? Okay, now, Ashari, I mean, sorry, Muhammad Hassan, are you a Salafi? Are you a Salafi, Muhammad Hassan? So according to you, Muhammad Hassan, because there is now great confusion and division and disorder in the Sunni, that means Muhammad is a liar, Allah is a liar, they're both in hell. You see what you did again? No, 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 don't lie to me. Because you can't just say you're Muslim. The Ahmadiyya say they're Muslim. Do you agree? Are they Muslim? Are Ahmadiyya Muslim? See, you're playing games with me. No? Okay, so they say they're Muslim. So are you Ahmadi? You say no. So what are you? What are you? Do you believe in Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama? Are you Sunni or are you Rafida? Do you curse the companions of Muhammad and curse his wives to hell? And believe Ali was the only one who should have been the, the Khalifa? Do you believe that? Do you damn Abu Bakr? So wait, do you believe in Abu Bakr? Do you believe in Uthman ibn Affan, Omar ibn al-Khattab, that they were uh, rightly guided caliphs? So then you're a liar, you're a Sunni. See, I just caught you in a lie. It's stuck for a lot of Bilalameen. Why are you lying to me? You're Sunni. Because the Rafida say Abu Bakr, he's cursed. Omar ibn al-Khattab is cursed. Uthman ibn Affan is cursed. Muawiyah is cursed. Yazid ibn Muawiyah is cursed. The wives of your prophet, they're cursed, like uh, Aisha. But you don't, you believe, you don't believe that. I said Rafida. I know not all Shia. Audhu billah min Muhammad rajim. I said the Rafida, right? Is that what the Rafida believed? The Twelvers. He won't call. It's okay. Okay. Now, so now, do you believe Allah? has eyes and hands and a shin and a waist or they're not literal Allah doesn't actually have eyes oh so you are Salafi and you lied to me again what a wicked Muhammad Hassan why are you lying man you are Salafi because can you admit to them the Ashari and the Maturidi don't believe Allah has eyes don't believe he has hands now Muhammad Hassan does Allah have a right hand, left hand, or does he have two right hands? Does he have two right hands or a right hand, left hand? How many, are they two right hands or a right hand and a left hand? Okay, you guys, you heard it? Two right hands, but not like our hands. But Muhammad Hassan, you're not saying anything. Is your hand the same as the hand of a gorilla or is it different? Guys, let me deal with Muhammad Hassan, guys. Don't try not to text too much. Let me deal with him. Muhammad Hassan. Muhammad Hassan. You have a right hand. A gorilla has a right hand. Is your right hand like the gorilla's right hand? Is your right hand like a gorilla's right hand? A chimpanzee's right hand? You sure they're the same? So you want to say you're a monkey and a gorilla? They're the same, you sure? So guys, when he says Allah has two right hands, but they're not like anything in creation, he's not telling you anything. Because everyone in creation, right, that has hands, they're not the same. My hands are not the same as the hands of a gorilla or a chimpanzee or orangutan. My feet are not the same as the feet of a dog. Cats walk on all fours, but their fours are not the same. So he's basically saying Allah has a body, but it's unlike anything in creation. So Muhammad Hassan, why are you doing that to yourself? No, I, dude, are you, are you serious? 
Jesus became man, he became flesh and has a physical body. Of course he's going to have hands. What kind of human being would he be if he didn't have physical hands? But you don't believe Allah became man. You don't believe Allah became physical. You don't believe Allah became part of creation. Allah as Allah has two right hands, has a shin, has a waist and has eyes. And Allah has three eyes or more. <whistles> My goodness. You, can you believe it? Muhammad Hassan's Allah is a grotesque monster. You know why? Because the word in Arabic for eyes of Allah is three or more. It says the eyes of Allah. And in Arabic, it's three or more. So he has at least three eyes. And he just told you he has two right hands. So imagine Allah's like this, right? If I can put it right here. Right here, see? This is Allah. Cyclops, yeah, exactly. And that's his God, a grotesque looking monster. Now for the rest of you, did you learn about the immeasurability and comparability of God, the true God? The immeasurability and the incomparability of God. He is incomparable, he's incomparable. Okay? So that means now that when you read the Bible, read it afresh. What do I mean read it afresh? Meaning now read it with the understanding that there are going to be things in the Bible I can't comprehend. They're beyond comprehension. So you have three choices. Okay, are you ready now? You have three choices. One choice is to say the Bible contradicts itself, reject it. Another choice is when you can reconcile them, do so. As long as you're honest to Scripture. Or when you can't, you let both be true. This is true. This is true. I don't understand how it works. It seems to be a contradiction to me. But it's not a contradiction to God. He's an infinite mind. Or you can do the third thing. Force one set of scriptures to agree with another set of scriptures and explain them away to agree with those scriptures you like. So you have three options, folks. Can I repeat the options? Are you ready for me to re repeat the options for you? You have only three options. Are you ready? Okay. One option is to say that the Bible contradicts, reject it. But in doing so, you make yourself God, judge, jury, and executioner. It has to make sense to me. And if it doesn't, it has to be wrong. So you become now the standard of truth. So you become your own God, Satanism. Another option is you, you focus on those passages you like. And the other passages, you then make them agree with the passages that you like. Force them to fit. But then that's not being honest to Scripture. Or the third option is realize I don't know how these passages and these passages come together. I'm not able to reconcile them. But since they're in the Bible, I affirm all of what the Bible says, even though I'm not able to comprehend it all, because I trust God, this is his word, and it makes sense to him. And that's the approach of a believer. That's the approach of someone who realizes he's finite, temporal, imperfect, and fallen. And the Bible is God's perfect word and reveals an infinite mind that's perfect and yields to it. Says, I yield. I accept. All of it is true. Okay. How's that a fourth option? What if I give a fifth option, truth defenders? Why don't I block truth defenders and that'll be a fifth option because he's only adding to chaos and confusion? Okay. I gave one example. Do I need to give another example? Okay. Hold on, let me say something. Hold on. I don't know. So someone just texted me. Folks, if you have a question or two, we can. Oh, so I don't know. So, Zach, if you're watching, you want to call me and take your question on air? Is that what you want? I don't know. Are you Because you said pastoral advice. 
Pastor Vi sometimes implies something personal. So you want to call me Why? and I, if I can, if I can't, I'll just say I can't give it to you. This brother wants to call. Let me call him. See, he's got advice. And then we'll open up the floor to a question or two. And I'm going to retitle, retitle this. I'm going to retitle this, the incomprehensibility, the immeasurability, and incomparability incom of, of God. Okay? That's it. Hello? Hey, Sam. What's up, buddy? Um, yeah, like I said, just some advice if you'd be if I can. just to give it. Sure, if I can. Uh, let me see if I can. I don't know. Maybe it's something I'm not qualified to, but go ahead. Um, yes, yeah, so, so just briefly, um, I'm going through a bit of a period of depression. Mm. And one thing that I struggle with is praying and reading the word. Yes. And I know that this perspective is probably wrong, and I'm, I'm kind of calling, because if you can correct me, that sure. would be great. I kind of tell myself when I don't feel like praying or reading the word, you know, I shouldn't because it's like I don't want to offer prayers that don't feel genuine and from my heart. You know, I want to feel like something I have to do. But I'm also aware that's something that I should do. But, again, I struggle with that desire and that genuineness because when I do speak to God, I want it to be sincere. Yeah. Do, you know, do you know what I mean? It's a bit of a ramble, but just any – thoughts or whatever would be appreciated. Yeah. Now you said, repeat what you just said again. You want your conversation with God to be sincere, right? Yes. Why do you want it to be sincere? Because you feel what again? What are you feeling? That you uh, that's not from your heart and you're not sincere? Uh, I, wanna, I want you to hear yourself. What you said? Yeah, I, I guess in the sense that, like, I, I, you know, kind of don't want to be, I guess, coming to God in a bad mood, if yeah. you know what I mean, or even like I'm just not feeling good and, um, okay. you, you know, with where I am, with the stuff that's going on. Um, and that, so you uh, feel bad that you're coming to God in a bad mood and not in a happy state and delighting to come to God's presence, right? And that's bothering you, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. friend, you just answered your own question. The very fact that your desire is to want to be in a condition that you come to God in a positive mood, in a mood that's joyful, because you don't want to disappoint God, that's honoring to God, and God blesses it. You understand what you're saying, right? You're not, yeah. you're not at the point where you don't care about God, you don't care how God feels, you don't care how you feel about God, you actually care, and that's why it's bothering you, and that's what God honors. The fact that you care that you are struggling with depression and in a bad mood, and you feel like when you come to God in a bad mood, you're dishonoring God, and that's bothering you. And God blesses you for that. Because God is a father. A good father doesn't turn away a child who's sad and depressed and crying. That's when the good father wants to the child to comfort that child and love that child and affirm the child. What kind of father would God be that if you're depressed and in your darkest moment, and your greatest need of him, he says, you know what? Don't even look at me until your your attitude is better. Yeah, I, I guess it's kind of, like you said, the my perspective, because it's, exactly. um, um, like I said, uh, you know, when, when we pray, we should be, like, thankful. But, and it's like, so when I don't feel genuinely thankful i'm like well when i pray i should be thankful about things but i just don't have it in my heart to give thanks and that about bothers things. you right I've even, I've even yeah well i've even prayed like lord show me what i should be kind of thankful for or and, how to be thankful and you think when you when you're bothered by it and you tell god that that god is not pleased and he doesn't bless your prayer god knows your heart better than you do knows your condition better than you do and he doesn't want fake he wants genuine relationship He's not afraid 
of your anger. He's not afraid of your disappointment. He's not afraid of, of anything that you may be harboring in your heart that makes you feel far from God. And I'll prove it to you. Jeremiah 15, verses 15 to 21. You read it at your own leisure. Jeremiah 15, verses 15 to 21. Jeremiah had hit a point of depression that he started accusing God's, God and questioning his integrity. It's Jeremiah 15, verses 15 to 21. Because people were mocking Jeremiah, scoffing Jeremiah, because Jeremiah was zealous for the honor of God. Jeremiah was zealous for the word of God. And anyone who opposed the word of God, Jeremiah was very harsh with and wouldn't associate with. So got to the point where he became alone. And in his loneliness, he became sad and depressed and miserable. And then he got to the point where he blamed God for his misery. In other words, God, it's because of you I'm miserable. But you claim to be the fount of living waters. And yet when I came to find waters to refresh me, I found nothing but misery. Are you a deceptive brook that failed me? God didn't say, damn you, go to hell. He goes, if you repent and speak what is wise and no longer speak foolishly, I will restore you and make you a prophet to these people again. In other words, God is not afraid. God is not afraid, right? Of someone feeling angry or disappointed in him, God is not afraid. Sorry about that, guys. There's a scary monster right there, I know. Okay? He wants you, you, and he wants all of you, and he wants you to be genuine with him. The very fact that you're troubled, by your condition and how you praise God, God honors that. The very fact that you are troubled means that you want to be in love with God and connected to God. That's all good. So don't let Satan whisper in ears because let me tell you the scheme of the devil. Let me tell you the scheme of the devil. Let me tell you how he works. He tries to get you to the point of feeling so unworthy to approach God in order to disconnect you from God and turn away from God because once you're disconnected from God, you're disconnected from the power and the security that only comes from God to save you from the enemy. And now you're in his territory and he can beat you down and make you do things that otherwise you would not do because now you are disconnected from the Lord. You are far from the Lord. You're no longer connected in union with him because your victory and your security and your preservation comes from being in union with him no matter how you feel. But Satan will play on your mind, and he'll play a trick on your mind saying, look, look at you, you fake. How can you go to God with this kind of attitude? You know you don't, you're not feeling it, and you know it's not, you don't want to do it. Don't be a hypocrite. Just stop. And that's when he wins. God, I feel that. Um, of course you do, because that's how Satan works. attacking myself. And, but um, that's how Satan like, works. Yeah. yeah, well, I was kind of wondering if that uh yeah is factoring into things because it's like i definitely know that as, ba as bad as things are for a moment there is some greater plan that i can't see and and i don't reject that it's just you know some of those day-to-day -day moments some of those low moments but i you know i'm kind of thinking it's well that's probably those days where the enemy is more hard at work exactly. trying to separate me from that's exactly what he's doing because uh -huh. he wants to disarm you because one of your weapons against Satan, it's in Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. Start reading Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. You can start at 12 to 18. Mm -hmm. There, God tells you what your weapons are to resist the devil and overcome him. One of, it, one of those weapons is prayer. Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. So Satan knows what your weapons are, and Satan knows that if you know how to use your weapons, he's ineffective against you. So what he does is he tries to put you in a situation and instigate where you of your own start putting down those weapons and you become pretty much powerless against them. So he starts with making you feel too guilty to go before him in prayer, to God in prayer. And then he strips you of one piece. And then on the other, when you feel too guilty to go to God in prayer and worship, you then feel too guilty to go to God's word and hear his voice. And that's the sword of the spirit. Ephesians six seventeen says, your sword from the spirit to use against Satan is the word of God. But if he can try to stop you, disconnect you from prayer and reading the word, he's now stripped you of some of your most effective weapons against him until finally you're completely powerless against him. So don't fall for his schemes. Don't fall for his schemes. Because I'm going to tell you what the Christian life is. It's a relationship. 
Why do you think the Bible talks about Christ being our husband? And for those who are married, this will ring true. I don't know if you're married. I don't know if are, are you married, brother? No, I'm not. Okay. This is going to ring true. And if you don't learn it now, you won't have a successful marriage. And it's, and, but if, here's the problem with that too. It's got to be, it can't be one-sided. Both partners have to learn this. You may be doing your part, but the other partner may check out. So then it won't be any fault of you that it ends. But let me tell you what a relationship is from scripture. People think love is simply an emotion you have. It is true. It is emotion. God wants you to worship him with your emotions. He gave you emotions to use to worship God. But if love is only emotion, then none of your relationships will last. Because I don't know of anyone who's married that wakes up every day delighted and happy to see their spouse. There are times in which you wake up and regret and dread that you're in the same bed with this person or in the same home with this person. But that's when you have to learn. It's not about how I feel. Because the Bible describes true love, God's love, as action. No matter how I feel, no matter my mood, I'm going to still act in love and do what love requires towards the other person, irrespective of how I feel. That's what relationship is. Doing the deeds of love, the acts of love towards the other, even when you're not feeling it. And once you learn that, then all your relationships will last. What am I saying? You have a relationship with your husband, Jesus Christ. Your relationship doesn't is not based on how you feel. It, does, it can't be based on how you feel. Your relationship is based on the fact that I belong to Jesus. He's my spiritual husband. I'm a spiritual bride. And I'm going to continue to show him the acts of love, whether I feel like it or not, because that's what a good spouse does. Show acts of love to the beloved. God knows your heart better than you do. And God is not going to be angry and say, oh, well, you don't mean it. You're not feeling it. Get, get away from me. No, he actually will honor that even more. Look, look at my servant. Look at my son. Look at my child. He's miserable and depressed, and yet he still gets up and reads my word. He's miserable and depressed, and he still gets up and sings my praises. He's miserable and depressed, and he still speaks to me and opens his heart to me. That's my child. That's my servant. That's my spouse. And friend, you're talking to someone who's gone through it. I'm speaking from personal experience, my brother. Let me tell you my story, okay? November 6, 2017. November 6, 2017. The wicked, filthy whore of a judge ordered me out of my home because my ex-wife and her conniving lawyers managed to convince the judge that she wouldn't be safe in the house with me, even though she was the abuser. And so I was ordered out of the house, November 6. I had a friend who owned an apartment and had a garage. That garage he converted into, he converted into an apartment. Okay. November in Chicago. November in Chicago is cold. I had to go sleep on a mattress in a garage in that situation. While my daughters were in my home and my ex-wife's Puerto Rican adulterous lover coming in at night at 10 and staying there till 4 or 5 in the morning, defiling her like an adulterous whore. And I was in that house, miserable, depressed, sad because I was left helpless to protect my children. But throughout that, by the grace of God, I continued to still cry to Jesus, pray to Jesus. Study his word, teach, and remain faithful by the grace of God's spirit. And here I am now. So you're yeah. talking to someone who's practicing what I'm preaching to you. Uh, yeah, I uh, don't doubt that at all. Um, and it's kind of like, you know, I, why, I, I don't like to you know, necessarily complain about my situation because I know everyone's got their own stuff um but yeah it's just been quite well uh, I, you know i've got a in a form of crohn's so, so a disability and i've yes. had for a very long time and it's just been 
past five couple of years trying to find my meaning and more importantly where God wants me. Like when people ask me what I want to do, because at the moment I'm brother, not, you I said you have or anything. I'm just trying to wait on what God wants me to do. But so far, He hasn't shown me. But well, well I'm just on. trying to be patient. Don't, don't say He hasn't showed you. You have Crohn's, you said. Uh, well, technically, colitis. Colitis, okay. You know what God wants you to do? You don't have to wait. I'm going to give you the answer. He wants you to glorify him through your colitis as a witness to others who have that same disease, that even with this disease, we can still endure by his grace and give God the glory. You don't have to wait. Worship God in your condition, and that will be a testimony to others. Wow, you got colitis? And you're still worshiping Jesus? And you're still trusting in Jesus? And you still love Jesus? Man, if God can do that through you, I want to know your God and I want to worship that God. God wants you to use your ailment to glorify him. So what do you mean you're waiting? There's nothing to wait. He wants you to honor yeah. him through your ailment. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I was thinking, um, I, I definitely agree with that. Yes. It reminds me of... Uh, what Paul says, um, I can't remember exactly, but the thorn in his side yes. and how he's thankful for it. Um, yeah, I try to kind of be more like Paul. That well, What I was kind of thinking was in terms of like my career. Currently, I yeah. don't have one. Um, and so just... And God to, is still sustaining you, know. you right now, right? Without a career? Uh, yes. You know yes, why? Yes, absolutely. Okay, now you know why? Because God wants you to take this time to grow in him. Take it as a blessing. Look at you. You're thinking... What's my career going to be? Jesus says, do not worry about what tomorrow brings because you have enough worries with today. When to co tomorrow comes, then you worry about it. Why are you worried about tomorrow when Jesus wants you to focus on today and mo make the most of today in glorifying him? In fact, take it as a blessing. Even though I don't have a career, God is still paying my bills. Still feeding me. I still have my daily bread. So I'm going to take this time now to engage in intense prayer, worship, fasting, studying the word, and growing in him. Why are you worried about tomorrow, my brother? I guess worried isn't the right word. No, I'm, even I'm thinking about what I you're going to do in the future. Pa pa patience. Yeah, well, take, me, take it as me trying to tell you what the Lord's trying to tell you. Don't worry. And then I say worry. Don't think about what your career is going to be. Rest in my love. Rest in me. Take this as my grace. You're home, and I'm paying your bills, and I'm feeding you. So all you do is now full-time worship me. Rest in me. Rest in my peace and grace, and be thankful for my provision. And by the way, you're not the only one. Brother, let me tell you something. Many people are listening right now to you, to me because of COVID-19. They're left jobless. You know what they're doing? All right. Well, I can't work. So I'm going to get on the Internet and I'm going to have an online family of believers to meet with them, pray with them, sing with them, love Jesus, love on them and learn. Study the word like you're doing. See? Yeah, that's yeah, I have been doing a lot. I've been tuning into a lot of your live streams and things like that see um contentness i think is something that i need to try and focus on more i'm going to send you a series of verses i'm going to give them to you now if you want to write them down but what i'm trying to say brother have a biblical perspective wow even though i don't have a career i'm still not homeless i'm eating my bills are being paid so now i have nothing but time to grow in love with my jesus and rest in him wow you know, people become monks to do that. You have monasteries where people go to monasteries because they want to be in your situation where they can only focus on Jesus and worship Jesus and not work and pay bills. And God is saying, look, I've given you a monkish life. So now start worshiping me. And when the time is right, I will tell you what's next for you. But don't worry about tomorrow. Focus on today. But I'm going to give you a set of verses. I want you to write down because I want people to hear them, and then I'll send them in the comment section for you, right? So I want you to write down Psalm 38. Make sure you read Psalm 38. Okay? So, guys, if you're going taking notes, take the notes down because I'm going to give you a series of verses for all of you to benefit every one of you. Psalm 38. Make sure you read Psalm 38, right? Got it. Psalm 73. Read all of Psalm 73. 
73. You got to read them and pray over them as you're reading them, right? Pray to the Lord, Psalm 73. I would then add Psalm 23. Add Psalm 23 as well, okay? Matthew 6, 25 to 34. Matthew 6, 25 to 34. Six twenty-five to thirty-four. Okay. John fourteen, verse twenty-seven. Fourteen twenty-seven. Okay. John sixteen thirty-three. I got a lot for you to read. So see, because all you're going to do is sit, and read, and pray over them, meditate over them. John sixteen, verse thirty-three. Sixteen thirty-three. Okay, you got that one right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what I want you to do is. Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, read verses 2 to 5. Romans chapter 5, verses 2 to 5, right? Romans 5, 2 to 5. Okay. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 39. Romans 8, 28 to 39. 28 to 39. All right, we're not done yet. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 11. 2 Corinthians... Chapter 1, verses 3 to 11. 3 to 11, chapter 1. Yes. Second Corinthians, chapter 4, verses 7 to 18. Second Corinthians, chapter 4, verses 7 to 18. 4, 7 to 18. And you mentioned the one about Paul, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. I want you to read what Paul went through and how he survived. So this is about Paul and how he survived. Second Corinthians 11, 21 to 33. 21 or 33. 21, 33. Okay. And then 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 to 10. 12, 7 through to 10. And then I want you to write Hebrews 13, verses 5 to 6. Hebrews 13, 5 to 6. And then Revelation 14, 12 to 13. Revelation 14, 12 to 13, the key verse will be 13. 14, 12 to... Yeah, 14. chapter 14, verses 12 to 13, but the key verse is 13. So you're going to read chapter 14, verses 12 and 13, yeah. but focus on verse 13, and then I want to put the icing on the cake. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. 2 Timothy 4, 16, 18. 16 to 18. You know what? I'm going to give you a cherry on top. I'm going to give you one more. A cherry on top. You ready? Mm-hmm. 2 Timothy 1, 7, all the way to 12. 1, 7 to 12. That's it. You got it. I'll Read over them. Down. Meditate. Pray over them. And know God's promises are true and have no doubt. Okay? And so just, just to, this might seem like an obvious question at this yes. point, but sometimes it's just all I feel like it's just like a... A little just meek prayer of just like, God, I'm just feeling terrible right now. Can you just please be patient with me of and course. bless me? Of course. I can just comfortably go there and just try to, you know, live well, but just kind of just God just, you know, just be long suffering with me here. He is. And Very you. He is. You don't need to ask him, but feel free to ask him. Speak your heart to him. God loves you more than you can imagine, even though Satan wants you to doubt it. And he has unlimited patience with you because you are his. You are in his heart. In fact, I'm going to give you two more because of that. Proverbs 27, verse 10. You know what it says? Proverbs 27, verse 10. Brother, you know what it says? I'd love you to tell me. It says, though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Though my father... Or mother will forsake me, the Lord will receive me. I'm sorry, Psalm 27.10. Thank you, because see, someone put Proverbs. I apologize. Psalm 27.10. Thank you, because the moment he put Proverbs, I'm sorry. I don't know why I was thinking Proverbs. Psalm 27, verse 10. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for correcting me. Psalm 27.10, not Proverbs. I don't know why Proverbs came into my mind. <laughs> That's interesting. Oh, yeah, I know why. Do you know why Proverbs came into my mind? Mm -hmm. Okay, now I, now I know why I said Proverbs. Because as you were talking, what came to my mind was Proverbs 28, 26. So that was Psalm 27, verse 10. Psalm 27, verse 10, 
where it says, though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Even if your parents abandon you, Jesus has sworn, I will not abandon you. So take him at his word. And this is why Proverbs came in my mind. Proverbs 28, 26 says, the fool trusts in his heart. In other words, don't go by how you feel. God is telling you, don't go by your emotions. Trust me instead, no matter how you feel. It's Proverbs 28, 26. So Satan That's wants a you. Hard calling to Say do. it again. I don't want to be a fool. Uh, it's, a, it's a hard calling to do. Uh, of course. But I, I don't want to be that fool. No, but brother, no one said it's easy. But what it is is just remind, remind yourself. My emotions are tainted, polluted by sin, and they're manipulated by Satan. Tell the Lord, say, Lord, I don't feel it, and my heart hurts, and I'm doubting, but I'm going to take you at your word, and I'm going. that's why it's trust. My friend, trust means, look, I'm taking you on a journey, but you're going to have to trust me. I'm going to get you there, and no one's going to stop me. So do you trust me? Then don't let your heart sway you. Otherwise, don't let the satanic whisperings cause you to doubt. Give me your hand. Trust me. I'm going to get you there. Trust me. I'm going to get you there. Don't go by how you feel. And that's what Proverbs 28, 26 says. The fool trusts in his heart. So write down Proverbs 28, 26. Then I want to give you Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 6. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 6. You know what it says? Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6. Here's what you need to do. You tell your heart, heart, I don't trust you. You're polluted. You're tainted. You're corrupted. And Satan can influence you. Instead, Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. You see? That's what I need to do. You have to. So now train, exercise yourself not to go by what your heart tells you. Because God says, you'll be a fool if you trust your heart over against me. You trust me, don't trust your heart. So I'm going to leave it with this. I'm going to give you this final one. Isaiah 49, verse 15. I'm going to read it for you, right? Final one for you. Isaiah 49, verse 15. And by the way, truth defenders, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 4, not 1 Corinthians, you little sinner. All right? Anyway, Isaiah 49, verse 15. Can a mother, this is for every one of you, especially you, my brother. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. Let me read it one more time. Holy Spirit, take these words you inspired and etch it in the hearts of everyone listening, especially my brother, Zach. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. I will not forget you. So now God is saying, are you going to trust your heart or my word? It's up to you. That's his I don't want to trust my heart. Amen. Yeah, I don't. Hallelujah. So now train yourself to go against your emotions and to trust God's word, even if you're not feeling it. So I pray the Holy Spirit will use these passages to speak to your heart because, again, God loves you more than you know, and he just wants you at the end of the day don't give in to your emotions. Trust me. Don't give in to your emotions. Instead, take me at my word because I can never lie. It's impossible for God to lie. And I will never leave nor forsake you. Okay? Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's moving me in my spirit. It really Good. is. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to your spirit. He's telling you, Zach. Listen to the words of my servant. These are my words. And I'm saying to you, Zach, I love you with an everlasting love. I'm in love with you. Trust me. 
Don't give in to your emotions. I'm with you and I am walking with you on this journey and I feel your pain and nothing will ever sever you from my love. Just trust me, Zach. Don't trust in your heart. Yeah, I'll try to do that and to rebuke Satan as well. Hallelujah. He's going to find me every step of the way. So if you want to pass it to rebuke Satan, James 4, verses 7 to 8. James 4, verses 7 to 8 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. James 4, verses 7 to 8. Okay, my brother? Yeah. I just really hope that uh, other people will eventually see the Spirit work through me like I see it with you, Sam. It's just incredible. That's why I wanted to call. It's like I know I could have maybe just Googled this and read some stuff online, but I was like, maybe if Sam's willing, just because the way the Spirit works through him, you know, so it's like I'd love to just take advantage of his wisdom, his knowledge. So I can't say how much I appreciate it. Brother, I am your servant for the sake of Jesus, and you'll never have to thank me, and I'll be here as much as I can to serve you. But I want you to share something with you. You think that the Spirit was using me only. No, he used you as well because in your infirmity and being open with it, others now heard your struggle, will now be praying for you, and others heard the goodness of God and these words. Now, because of you, the Spirit using you, you've now encouraged others and strengthened them if you can only see their reaction. So it's not just me he used. He used you and me together and your infirmity to bring glory to Jesus. That's how majestic the Spirit is. In your infirmity, he moved you and used you and your infirmity and me to give Jesus glory and to strengthen each other to have no doubt that Christ is real. So thank you for uh, being used of the Spirit. Thank you. I'm just in awe of the way that, well, it's just God's faithfulness, isn't Hallelujah. it? And yeah. just using every situation for his glory. Hallelujah. And in the process, blessing you. So go on, go on YouTube, go to YouTube and find the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Listen to that. Go to YouTube, play this, search Christian song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. If, in fact, if I sing it, I'll start crying. Hmm. Yeah, I don't, yeah, just listen yeah. to that song. That will move you. I'm just thinking about it, I'm about to cry. All right? I'll just give you the first line. It's, Great is thy faithfulness, O oh God, my Father. I can't. I want to stop because I'm going to start crying. <clears throat> so, yeah, I don't know. If there's a song that you may have heard that gets me, the group uh, Mercy Me, and yes. the song uh, Even If You Don't, that one crushes me every time. Amen. Amen. May the Lord refresh you. May the Lord Jesus, the Son of God who lives, heal you. May the Son of the Beloved, the heart of the Father, fill you, flood you in his infinite love, peace, and joy, and the Holy Spirit seal you and speak to your heart and say to you, Zach, Zach, you are mine. You are mine forevermore, and I will never let you go. Please, Lord Jesus, speak to him as only you can speak to him and speak to us. We entrust him to you. O oh, Son of God, have mercy in Jesus' name. And Lord, I want to give you thanks for who you are and that you raise up people like Sam to encourage me to strive towards you and closer to you and to be more secure in your love. That will never fail me. So thank you for the way that you work in this world and that I'm able to connect with Sam like this and have that communion when things are difficult. Thank you that your faithfulness is shining through. Even when I'm weak, you are my strength. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen, Thank you. Amen, amen. Brother, that prayer, how did it feel when you prayed that prayer? It felt very genuine. See? God is There's healing no, you. No doubt. God is healing you already. You see? Mm. Draw closer, and he'll draw closer to you. Always. In fact, Jesus is saying, Zach, I've been here all along. I'm in you, next to you, and around you, and I'm surrounding you with my love. Never doubt. 
never doubt he loves you all right yeah yeah and i hope i can do better and be a better servant and have no days of doubting hopefully that might be a, a bit of a, a lofty goal but if i fall short of it then i'll have a lot of days of not doubting that's just my hope yeah. don't just worry stay brother. Faithful. just remember this even when you doubt the lord understands your situation better than you but you're at the point where your doubts will not drown your trust in him that's the thing they can't and they will not because the Holy Spirit will always supply you with the faith you need to cling to him and to his cross. Because his cross is your chariot to glory. His cross is your chariot to glory. Cling to the cross. <clears throat> Tell me move in my spirit. <clears throat> cling to the cross because that's your chariot to heaven. And never let go of the cross of your Lord and Savior jesus christ because that's the cross that will take you into his presence and when he sees you he's going to say well done good and faithful servant zach it's time to enter your rest come home son and rest with me so the lord watch over you brother all right yeah thank you gosh it's just truly really love that we can never fully appreciate or comprehend isn't it it's exactly. just too much and he's real just he's real he lives, Zach. So although it's too much, it is real, and he absolutely loves you. All right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, Feel um, free to reach out to yeah, me anytime. Thanks, Just send me a text message, and if I'm lying, I'll call you. Just anytime, brother. Yeah. I appreciate you doing it live when there's probably people with other questions as well. Uh, yes. Yeah. Even, if, you're, even if I'm not live and you need to talk, send me something, and I'll try to get on when I can. Yeah, I'll keep that in mind because I want to grow and learn as much as I can in the scriptures Hallelujah. and in my love with Christ. Amen. That's that's my desire. And you're, and like you said, I should use this time where I've got nothing else to do. It's a blessing. Yes. And I should be yes thinking about that more. Yes, and Jesus and is saying. And it's part of the plan too. Part of course of it's a plan. Come. He's giving you a plan. He's saying, Don't Zach. Don't worry about that later. Yeah, he's saying, Zach. Rest in me. Grow to love me. Grow to be attached to me. And then when tomorrow comes, I'll worry about it for you. I will worry about it for you. Just rest in me, Zach. Rest in me. All right? I'll make, yeah, I'll make efforts to do that. And, uh, yeah, thank you again, thank Sam. You, and thank you, Lord, for Sam thank and you. for who you are. I, I appreciate it. I hope you have a really good night, Sam. Thank God you bless again. You, brother. Lord bless you. Take care and watch over you. Take care, brother. And your daughters too. Hallelujah. I hope that they're safe and secure and that you'll return to them soon because that would be amazing. In Jesus' name, it will happen this time. That's why I'm patient. Look at me, patient. Because I know my Lord lives and he's almighty. Yeah. And no one can dethrone you're, him and no one can stop him. You're a good example. Amen. I pray it so, can be better. Okay, thanks again, Sam. Good you, night. Brother. God bless you, brother. <laughs> Okay, folks, pray for Zach Olds. Please pray for him by name, Zach Olds. It's really late now. God showed up in a mighty way, didn't he? An amazing session. Aren't you thankful for the children of the devil? They come and challenge. They don't show up, and then God t t takes it and turns it an opportunity for me to be used of the Spirit, to glorify him, to show you how real God is, how beautiful God is, how pure God is, how loving God is, and how much he's in love with us, and that this Bible is supernatural. It is truly the word of God. Have no doubt about it. The Bible is supernatural, divine. It is God's word. The God of the Bible is God. He is real. He exists, and Jesus lives, and he can never die, and he's in love with us. So we love you, Father. Son of God, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you and we depend on you. Flood us in your presence. Flood Zach right now, Holy Spirit. Show him how real you are. And be with my daughters as well, in Jesus' name. Lord willing, see you later, later in the day. Christ is risen, risen indeed.